we'll ignore that. Right, so, okay, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I'm Tom uh, Brindle. Uh, I'm an associate consultant at uh, within the cultural heritage and archaeology team at WSP, based in their Birmingham office. Um, I've been at WSP just under a year, but prior to that, I was a post-excavation manager at Cotswold Archaeology for a few years. Um, I should imagine that uh, a lot of you have worked with, uh, with WSP before, come across us, um, so I won't go into it. I don't know why it's whizzing through those. I'll just keep an eye on that. Um, but basically, we provide the full range of, of um, consultancy services, including um, community engagement and how to sort of derive social value from projects. And it's this sort of area that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so over the past few years, uh, the team at WSP uh, have been involved in the delivery of heritage projects on some major infrastructure schemes. And so I wanted to discuss the ways that we've worked together with clients, uh, archaeological subcontractors, uh, local communities and other stakeholders to deliver some important and hopefully meaningful community engagement projects. Uh, so as will become clear throughout the case studies I present, and one of the key tenets presented in this paper is the importance of considering the potential for community engagement very early uh, in the stage of the archaeological process, so in the design phase uh, for major projects, so that we can really maximise the potential um, for uh, the potential for deriving public benefit from community outreach projects. Um, now, it's worth pointing out that this is one of the key messages um, that came out of CIFA's Delivering Public Benefit paper, which was published in collaboration with HS2 in 2021. And the other key point that I'm going to return to throughout this paper, um, which is aligned a bit with, with Emily's point, is the importance of collaboration and co-creation. So, you know, as archaeologists, um, I don't think we can really do community engagement effectively on our own. So we need to liaise closely with clients, with community groups, and other professionals outside of our sector, I'm skipping through here, um, uh, in order to, to derive benefit from what we're doing. Um, now, before I start properly, um, I should point out that I'm quite new to WSP, so a lot of the work I'm going to talk about was actually done by my colleagues, in particular, um, Mary Ruddy. Um, so, uh, I hope she wouldn't mind me showing this picture of her. But um, So, a lot of the work is Mary's, um, and she did a lot of work with, with other clients and partner organisations that I'll refer to as I go along. <laughs> so, the first case study I'd like to talk about um, is Liminster Bypass, uh, a site in West Sussex, where a new bypass has been constructed around the town. Uh, the work was commissioned by Jackson's civil engineers uh, on behalf of West Sussex County Council, and we acted as archaeological consultants responsible for designing the scope of the work and procuring the archaeological contractors um, who ended up being AOC, um, who are currently doing the, the post-excavation assessment work at the moment. Um, now, you do sometimes get a reference to community engagement in written schemes of investigation, um, but all too often it, it takes this sort of form. Um, so this is just something I, I found online doing the search. I'm going to keep it anonymised. But it simply says it's the only reference to community, uh, to public engagement within the whole WSI. Um, the archaeological investigations will be accompanied by public engagement that will be proportionate to the significance and communal value of the archaeological remains encountered. As a minimum, this will comprise engagement through social media targeted at key stakeholders and community groups huh. as appropriate, um, which you know, in my view, is so vague as to be almost meaning meaningless, you know, and we ought really to be able to be doing better than this when we're producing WSIs. So to give you an example um, that Mary put together from WSPs, this is the example from Liminster, and what I would argue is a good example. Um, so the planning archaeologist, uh, John Mills, had requested in advance that a community information action plan um, was part of the archaeological services. And so what we did within this WSI was an outline design for what that action place plan should be, which was written by Mary. That's very annoying that it keeps moving on. Um, now, the important thing to point out here is that we're not necessarily saying within the WSI exactly what should happen. Um, what we're doing is we're actually sort of putting in some detail about what the plan should include so that the contractor um, who is awarded the work actually has a very clear brief about what is required, rather than just you know do some community engagement, um, and it's important to note here as well that we're also really um, cognizant of the of the needs of the of the client um, and their strategy for engagement too. 
So Mary's um, WS, WSI specified to the contractor that, that, that their action plan need, you know, should include this as, as some examples. So a, a leaf, to, leaf look drop, project blog, virtual site updates, virtual finds talks, archaeological question panels, engagement with schools, regular archaeological newsletters, and she suggested timeline um, and for what issue might what each issue might contain, including things like possible images. And so her detailed brief enabled AOC to put together a much more detailed um, scope document. Uh, to, it was a 12 page community information action plan, um, which was kind of created in collaboration with Mary um, and with the, with the client, um, with, with the county council. Um, and it was produced well in advance of the spade going into the ground. So we had a plan set out before any field work was undertaken. I think that that's really critical that we start thinking about these things really early in the process. Um, so just to sort of move on to the next example, which is really quite similar. Um, Mark, we were talking about Thanet earlier on. So this was um, uh, a site um, in Kent, which was excavated by the contractor Canterbury Archaeological Trust. Uh, the client was Kent County Council, and we acted as consultants. Now. From the outset, it was considered very likely there would be major community interest in the site because some very significant archaeological finds had been found to the north. And so the uh, curator, uh, Simon Mason, requested a, a programme of community engagement um, in his brief. Uh, and so this just shows um, how dense uh, the, the archaeology actually was and how important um, it, it turned out to be. So, so community engagement was envisaged from the start. Uh, and when we were procuring the work, we asked the bidders to provide us with a very detailed community engagement plan uh, and we received tenders from four bidders and the work was ultimately rewarded to, to Canterbury Archaeological Trust. And that largely was on the strength of their community engagement programme, um, which demonstrated excellent links with local community groups, um, including the, the local archaeological society, detector clubs, but also local schools. And Cat also demonstrated a really excellent understanding of the general demographic of the area as well. And they presented us with clear opportunities about how they could engage uh, with, with people effectively. Um, and so again, they, they produced us with a 13-page community action plan, um, produced collaboratively, collaboratively between Cat, uh, WSP and Kent County Council, and again, before anything even happened in the ground. And so it was a case of putting a plan in advance and not reacting suddenly to sort of archaeological features that were coming out of the ground. I'd just like to move on. So the first two case study examples I've provided were uh, county council infrastructure schemes. Um, I'd like to sort of finish by talking about another major infrastructure uh, project we're all aware of, um, HS2. Um, so WSP uh, led on the design of the archaeology for the north section of um, HS2 phase one, um, <clears throat> uh, working for Lang O'Rourke and Jay Murphy and Sons. And we collaborated with a number of different contractors and dealt with a whole range of different archaeological sites on the north section of the route. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the, the, the individual um, sites because I know that Mary presented on this uh, last year and a lot of these sites have been well addressed. But for instance, we, we had on the Foss Way, uh, a site next to the River Lem where they had lots of um, Iron Age and Romano British archaeology, including a corn dryer. Um, there was a really important um, uh, 19th century cemetery discovered at Park Street in Birmingham with the remains of around 10,000 individuals, um, obviously a massive undertaking and, and very sensitive. Uh, Curzon Street, uh, thought to have been the world's oldest railway roundhouse terminus where locomotives were, were turned around before they were turned down the line to London. And at Coles Hill and Coles Hill Manor, um, really rich archaeological discoveries included prehistoric archaeology, um, burnt mounds, Pele channels, uh, just a vast amount. And then Coles Hill Manor has been very well publicised, uh, including the remains of a late medieval and post-medieval motive manor and gardens. So some amazing sites discovered on the, on, on, on the route, which were, um, in, which, which were publicised very, very well, I think. Now, um, it's worth pointing out that community engagement um, is recognised by HS2 as being of immense importance. And there are a number of objectives um, within HS2's herds. So their historic environment research and delivery strategy. And I believe John Hunstead's going to talk a bit about that a little bit later. 
Um, so a bit like uh, with the planning requirements um, of, the, of the council archaeologists I referred to earlier on, um, we had some sort of very high level, broad community of engagement objectives with which to work from. Um, and we were then required to actually turn these into a design. Um, and so we did this, and I say we, and again, I'm referring to Mary Ruddy here. I had nothing to do with it personally, but it was, um, so she, she, she organized a, uh, a series of stakeholder workshops um, in 2019. Um, and, and so what was really important to point out is these stakeholder workshops were organized in conjunction with a, a, a professional group of social anthropologists who provided us with um, advice on how we actually uh, approach the various different communities, um, who, what sort of stakeholder groups we should be looking at. Um, and I think that this is a really important to make of it, like Emily was making. We need to reach out of our discipline and tap into the expertise of other uh, professionals um, who have skills and knowledges that we often don't. Um, so the stakeholder workshops just include a whole range of different organisations based on this information, um, English heritage museums, local societies, clients, and various other different stakeholder representatives. But the point was that all of this, was, we were trying to understand the problems faced by these different groups uh, and what they might want, and trying to ensure that the way that we interpreted the herd's objectives um, actually fitted into what was wanted on the ground. Um, and so the creation of this new set of collaborations formed a really important part of our strategy, this sort of high level audience mapping, um, in order for us to design a brief. Um, and so it, it enabled uh, four overarching project plans to be designed. So the first was community excavation. Well, that never actually happened as it, as it turned out because of COVID. Uh, the next was, was um, local hubs. So museums, libraries and galleries along the route were established. Um, uh, Birmingham Museum, Think Tank, the Pottery Museum in Stoke and Solihull Core. And these were written into the plan to act as local venues where our engagement activities could take place. And these were established based upon the, the contacts that were built up during the stakeholder engagement sessions. Um, the, the next uh, uh, project plan was revitalizing networks. So this was basically about reconnecting with, with local schools, with um, archaeological societies and other interested parties uh, and making sure that everything was communicated well with them. Uh, and the other thing we did with these groups was to signpost to stakeholders um, other sources of funding outside of the project. So um, things like the Heritage Lottery Fund, but other sources too, so they could pursue other avenues of interest for their projects. Um, and then exhibitions, we utilised these local hubs that we'd established um, to present uh, relevant material from the route in these different areas. Um, now, as uh, with all my previous case studies, all of this work was done, this planning was done long before field work began. So there was a plan in place. A brief was then taken by the subcontractors and developed into more detailed action plans in collabor collaboration with WSP, LM and HS2. Um, and so the engagement program brought together local heritage groups, museums, universities, schools and the public um, to share and learn for a whole range of different activities such as webinars, YouTube series, exhibitions, schools, workshops and then even a creation of a, of a new young archaeologists club. But this was all established really early on um, in, in, in the project before field work commenced. So just to finish up, um, so firstly, um, as I've been banging on about, um, community engagement should really form an integral part of the early design phase of any project. Okay, So we shouldn't be waiting till we've dug up archaeology to think about what we're going to do. Uh, we need to ensure our plans align also with what the client and other stakeholders want, uh, and that there is a budget in place, obviously, which needs to be um, set up with the client um, initially. Um, and we need to do all of this to actually draw out the public benefit of what we're trying to do. Um, and secondly, the importance of collaboration, as well, as, as Emily was saying. You know, as a sector, we can't do it alone. Um, as archaeologists, most of us are, are technical specialists, and we're most effective at delivering uh, public benefit when we are plugged into other experts. Um, so, for instance, the client team, um, stakeholder engagement professionals, uh, school groups, community groups, professional interpretation specialists. And so, by working collaboratively and embracing knowledge and skills from a wide range of professionals, and doing very careful audience mapping early on, uh, we stand the best chance of delivering really valuable, meaningful, and long-lasting outreach legacies. I'll leave it there, thank you.